visualization is one of, for my for my side at least, one of the most important um, areas in supercomputing because um, you're not performing a simulation because you just can, but because you want to learn something about the data and um, the knowledge and the information that is hidden inside your data. And the only way to do that is using data analysis and visualization um, plays a very big part in that. So um, you should have seen the presentation by Donatello probably. Um, he's um, taking a different part into data anal analytics. Now we're just looking at um, how to create visualizations out of the data, 2D, da 2D data, 3D data, um, by mapping the abstract numbers of the data to graphical primitives, um, triangles, volume, volumes, voxels, and um, apply also additionally um, a color table, maybe also an opacity mapping, and then create some meaningful representations, vi visual representations of the data that help you um, analyze your data and see what's hidden inside. The first half an hour, probably, I will just give you a presentation um, showing some examples, lots of images, some animations. I'm not sure how good these animations are playing through. The slides um, as PDF can already be downloaded um, using the link that I provided. And um, there are also two small data files, NetCDF data files, that you can later use for playing along. But you don't have to play along right now, um, as I think this is all recorded. You can also download the data, download Paraview and install it and watch it again um, a second time. This is the way that we usually prefer to give Paraview courses. Um, we've done this in the past and hopefully we'll be doing this in the future at one day. Um, these are hands-on tutorials um, that we do with groups of 25 to 30 people. And um, in this setting, it's much easier, of course, to help the people if they're struggling, um, not finding the right option in the GUI, because uh, Paraview has a very big user interface and lots of possibilities, and it's sometimes easy to get lost also for us. Um, we provide hands-on tutorials for Paraview, NCL, and Vapor, and usually they last between two and five days. Um, the first days, we just give a general introduction to the software and tell the people how to get some um, standard data sets into and visualize them. And on the last day, we just work with them on their own data sets and try to visualize their data while they're in the workshop. Um, some of our online tutorials are already available and available on the DKZ website. Um, we are still working on creating some video tutorials, which would probably be a big help um, in, in these corona times of uh, getting to know Paraview. Um, but Paraview has a very, very big user community, both on the users as well as on the developer side, which is really a great benefit um, because um, if you're in struggle and something doesn't work, um, there's really a very big community. Um, I tell you some some links later on and that can be also downloaded, uh, seen in the, in the PDF that you can download, um, that is eager to help you and assist you. Um, and it's also very, very friendly. This is um, yeah, a screenshot of the website um, from DKZ, and there are some web tutorials already there. We plan to extend it even further um, to also other data sets. The visualization work at DKZ, what, what do we do? Um, generally, DKZ is in um, simple terms just a computing center, and we are here to assist the people in the weather and climate research community to do their work. So we have um, not only a big supercomputer, but also attached to the supercomputer, a big storage and also some GPU nodes. Um, so if you wish a visualization cluster on which some of the software works and runs, um, Paraview, for instance, NCL, um, IDL, MATLAB, um, and um, other software like Vapor. And you can work on these remotely from any place in the world. You just need an account, you reserve a GPU node, and then um, the session is transferred to your desktop using Turbo VNC and Virtual GL, and you can work on the data um, as you are sitting um, yeah, on, on the computer itself. With the benefit that you don't need to install the software yourself, we keep track that uh, the latest and greatest is um, installed on Mistral or Levanta. And also the benefit for you that you don't need to download the big data sets to your local workstation, but um, the big data does not leave the machine hall at DKZ. We are interested in working with large data sets, um, especially I am very interested in, in doing that. 
because um, in the last 12 years that I'm here at Dika that I've seen the numbers grow quite a bit and there's no, no real end in sight, which is fascinating on, on one side, but also um, applies some, some problems and issues in not only writing the data to disk from the simulation, but also in later handling the data and analyzing and visualizing it. There are some concepts um, that I will explain later in this presentation. And here we look at in situ um, relation with Paraview, but also into compression and progressive data visualization uh, using wavelets and WAPA. Other areas that we are interested in are visualization of uncertainty. Sometimes the models are run uh, in several instances, and then you can compute and derive the certainty or uncertainty of the data. Um, climate and weather data usually has tons of different variables, and here a multivariate data visualization where you represent some meaningful information from two, three, or four variables is sometimes tricky and difficult. And of course, machine learning and feature tracking, automatic feature tracking would be a great addition to our research. Why do we do data visualization in the first place? Um, as I told you, you can run a simulation, write out the data to disk, but um, if you are not able to look inside what's inside the data, and derive some conclusions for your research and for actions for politics, for instance, um, then it doesn't help you. You need to look inside the data, see, understand, in some cases even learn new, new occurrences or new correlations, and then communicate those results to your colleagues or to other people. And there are basically three forms of relation while you're doing it. The first one is confirmatory relation. If you know that certain features are in the data or should be in the data, like, like an AMOC in the ocean or maybe jet streams in the higher atmosphere, if they are missing, then you kind of have an idea that something in the simulation went wrong. Then if you are not sure what to find in the data, then you would like to explore the data in the most interactive way possible. So look at certain areas, apply some different color tables, do some thresholding clipping and whatnot and see um, what features are hidden in the data. And in the end, you would like to create some animations and stills to communicate your findings to your colleagues and to other people. So here's an animation that I've done some years ago um, using an icon run. Um, what you see is a, a 2D visualization of a vertically integrated cloud water and vertically integrated cloud ice. The cloud water is visualized um, as a, a white, partially transparent um, yeah, surface, and the vertically integrated cloud ice is, uh, has a turquoise color. The simulation um, has a very high temporal resolution and also a very high uh, spatial resolution of just 2.5 kilometers um, per cell, and you can really nicely see um, developments of the weather and the involvement of storm systems. If you look to the natural resolution, um, then you can see very small clouds and um, different features and structures. And then now you see one of the problems that we sometimes face. Um, there's so much information in the data that is sometimes difficult to find it. And this would be one of the areas that we would need to spend research in how to assist the scientists in finding their features and their structures that they're interested in in the data sets. This is also a high resolution ocean simulation um, at a depth of 75 meters. And what you see here is a multivariate visualization displayed are two variables. Color is mapped to the salinity of the ocean. Um, you see that um, different parts of the world's ocean have a different salinity with a high salinity in the uh, Mediterranean Sea, of course. And then you see some, some mapping that we additionally applied. This is bump mapping. I will explain this technique later as well. Um, here we accentuate the horizontal um, flow in the ocean, so the eddies, if you wish, to visualize both quantities at the same time. This is um, a similar representation, but not just um, as a longitude latitude mapping, but mapped to a sphere. And um, here you see the velocity of the ocean mapped to glyphs. Um, you see the orientation of the glyphs. And the bigger the glyphs are, and the more orange they are in this case, 
the higher the velocity is. This is um, this is the um, uh, visualization that I did this morning. Um, there was um, um, yeah an ICANN test run um, I think last or two weeks ago um, there in which they further increased the horizontal resolution of the ocean to 1.25 kilometers. Um, and um, here we have a model wider projection of an area 100 meter deep in the ocean. The sub areas as land surface, which are usually flooded by water. Um, this is a close up of the Mediterranean Sea, and you see the very fine details that are becoming visible now with these high resolution data sets. And as fascinating as this data really is, um, it is also not as easy to visualize. In 2D, it still kind of works, but in 3D, um, it becomes a problem. Um, also, when, for instance, in the atmosphere, the atmosphere um, has much sort of small, smaller time scales um, because um, the velocities of clouds and winds are much faster. What you see here um, is a interesting visualization that we submitted to this year's supercomputing visualization showcase. It's just a part of it. Um, what you see is um, the so-called Spielhaus projection. Um, the Spielhaus projection got quite a bit of attention over the last couple of years, and I was also fascinated by it because it allows us to visualize the oceans of the Earth, all oceans, as one body of water and really see the connections between all the oceans. There are two areas that are heavily distorted, for instance, in South America and Asia, um, where the poles are. But other than that, um, you can really see all the oceans connected as one um, and have not any clipping planes or cutoffs um, as in, for instance, longitude, latitude mapping, Cassini projection, and all the other things. By the way, if you're interested in these, uh, in getting getting your hands on these animations to show them somewhere else, um, just um, send us an email. Um, this is unfortunately not an relation created by us, but this is um, by nature. Um, it's a satellite image um, from NASA. And um, it shows um, the islands um, with um, some special forms developing behind. And um, this is a certain wind pattern that in the Middle Ages, um, the seafarers used to find out where certain lands are, um, where land surfaces is, when they explored the sea. And um, um, this, in this example, it's the Canary Islands. And we also created a relation using um, the 10 meter wind field um, using ICANN and a high temporal output. And you see these so-called Van Kaman vortex street um, developing between these islands. And um, this is all done in Paraview. The only um, field that I used for input was um, the 10 meter wind field. So the two scalar fields for um, the U and the V direction. And um, from there, I derived some other quantities like the magnitude, vorticity, the gradient of the vector field, a Q criterion um, to highlight um, the eddies um, in, the, in the flow field. And I also seeded um, some particles and then later combined everything together. Um, then over the last couple of years, um, not only the possibilities and tech techniques for relation have advanced in Paraview, but also the visual quality um, due to the advances of ray tracing. And um, there are two big companies um, developed ray tracing um, frameworks. One of them is Intel with Osprey and the other one being NVIDIA with Optics. What you see here is some um, relation using Optics from NVIDIA. And you see um, the southern tip of um, Africa and um, the Aguia current. You see the 3D streamlines um, of the Aguia current and also a um, scalar field um, showing the um, sea surface height. And you can see where the eddies kind of enclose some parts of the water and thrill around. And um, I also applied to direct the attention of the user a little bit, um, some, some special mapping um, known from pho photography, um, the depth of field. So um, yeah, to kind of steer the attention of, of the one who's looking at this. A couple of years back, um, we had a project here in Germany 
um, which was um, dedicated through some simulations, regional simulations um, at cloud resolving scales. And this is um, one of the results that you see here. You see liquid cloud water and cloud ice as uh, one 3D field cloud, um, also rendered using ray tracing. And um, you see the involvement of clouds and the transition from one cloud over to, to another cloud type. Um, and even though this looks pretty nice, we can do this even better now with path tracing. Um, this is an animation that we created last year um, and also submitted it to a visualization contest. And um, it was uh, an animation created for Dome. Um, unfortunately, it could not have yet shown um, in a Dome because um, due to Corona. Um, but what you see here is um, in a 180 degree view, you can also look at um, the YouTube link that is um, yeah, um, shown there below. Um, and you can pan the viewport around. There's um, some explanations of um, an ICON model, um, our new ICON Earth system model running at five kilometer for the atmosphere and the ocean and shows and explains some interactions that can be found at some places. Um, here shown is um, the island of Borneo and it showed uh, a couple of um, cycles on the day um, and um, explained a little bit on um, the um, involvement of clouds over Borneo. Um, since a couple of years, uh, <clears throat> we work with, um, with the ICON model. And in this example, you see ICON initialized with um, the same data, but at different scales. On the left-hand side um, is the low resolution version of ICON. And on the right-hand side is a very fine resolution of uh, ICON at 2.5 kilometer. And then uh, using the Diamond initiative, we also compared the capabilities and possibilities of various different models. One of these images is a satellite image um, from a Japanese satellite, Himavari 8, and all the others are representations of the different models, high resolution models that are developed around the world. Um, this is a very um, yeah, realistic representation that I created last year, also for the supercomputing conference. Um, the data is an ICANN simulation at um, 2.5 kilometers. And um, I use Paraview to just um, create the texture and later also um, an additional software to really have this physically based rendering of the Earth, showing the different um, textures of the Earth's surface by day and night, and also applied kind of a really realistic looking glossy mapping to these to the ocean surface. If you really want to get get very realistic. Okay, but how do we do that? Um, at DKZ, we have um, a supercomputer, um, our old one, Mistral, as you see here. In this one, we had um, 21 GPU nodes. They're either Haswell or Broadwell with up to one um, terabyte of main memory and four GPUs per node. It's quite outdated, but it still performs actually quite nicely for visualizing the data. And um, the new system is installed right now and is supposed to be in production by the end of the year. And of course, also the new system will have a couple of GPU nodes for relation and also a few more GPU nodes for um, computation. Here's a list of the software that we are using on Mistral or that we used to, to visualize the data. Everything that is highlighted in green is supported by DKZ and for which we also have some tutorials um, available. Earlier, we also used um, the software Aviso, which was a commercial product. But um, over the last couple of years, we changed to Paraview, which is a free software and much more, um, yeah, has much more potential um, and um, yeah, many more possibilities um, than, than Aviso for visualizing the data. One really cool feature that I would like to demonstrate later to you is the possibility to have linked views. So what you see here is um, um, a couple of different representations of the data. Um, on the left-hand side, you see a classic 3D view of um, Antarctica and in yellow, some uh, cells that are selected around it. And on the right-hand side, you see other representations of the same data and the same selection. The cells that are selected on the left-hand side um, show very um, 
so so the areas that are kind of sunken deep into the ocean because they are very cold and very salty and if you look closely at the um yeah parallel coordinate plots and um the plot matrix view on the right hand side this is the selection that i actually made so i selected very salty and very cold water and then looked into the 3d view where those cells are so you can really use um para view for an interactive exploration to find certain interesting correlations of some variables something like a spreadsheet view where you can just um, sort the variables um, by um, an ascending or descending order and you can also make selections in there for instance to find some outliers the power and power view stand for parallel and um, this is also what PowerView is really good at. Uh, if you have access to a couple of GPU nodes, um, then you can run PowerView in parallel and it's much, much faster. And you can also visualize very, very big data sets. Um, this just works like that you, using a script, start a couple of PowerView server um, processes and then one GUI client and to the user, in the end, when he connects to the PowerView servers, it looks seamless. So under the hood is what you see in the upper part of the image. So every different color in the ocean is um, visualized or represents a different visualization node. But the user sees just the thing at the bottom. So like in this case, see a temperature surface. If you have very, very large data sets, um, then you need to think about some additional concepts on how to tackle this. At DKZ, we think of in situ relation and progressive data relation. I will just briefly um, talk about in situ relation now. In situ is um, a process where you just try to combine simulation and relation in one and just write out um, yeah, a small subset of the data. The normal relation pipeline looks like this. So on the left-hand side, you simulate, um, you have your simulation code, and then you save everything to disk because you would like to analyze it later. And you have this big chunk of data. Then you read it back in, then you extract some data, map it, and then you render it. And then you have your, your feature like the store is extracted. An intermediate step would be that you perform some data reduction on during the simulation. Um, so just write out a subset of the data and then later read in the small data and render it. But um, the final way would be that you do everything um, during the simulation. So you simulate the data and while the data is in main memory, you reduce the data, extract your features, map your data features to geometries and the color table, and then just write out the, the images that you're interested in. And this is also the approach that we followed. We have a prototype for, for doing this. Using Paraview, you can generate uh, a Python script that tells um, the, the catalyst process later what to do. And this is hooked up to the icon model. And um, you can simply render images or use um, write out data um, for, for data reduction. This all has some advantages and drawbacks, of course. The advantage is that um, it's much less I.O. required. Therefore, the simulation is way faster and you need less disk and you get a preview of the data. Um, the time to knowledge is also much shorter and it gives you the possibility to even analyze extremely large simulation output that otherwise would not be possible because you don't have that much disk, or disk space available. Um, the drawbacks are that you need additional resources um, and you need a priori knowledge to what you would like to find. If you don't know what to find, um, then it will probably also be difficult to find the features and structures that you're interested in. And if you apply some threshold filter and you miss your feature and you write out the data, then everything that you've not written out is gone. So you would need to rerun the simulation again. Um, I will skip over this. So generating that with Paraview is very easy. But um, I will explain a little bit um, on this. So what we've done, we started refactoring other in-situ code, which was way too complex, and started fresh using 
just a hundred lines of Fortran and C++ code. And um, it was, um, it allowed us in a tightly coupled setting. That means um, for every simulation process, there's also a visualization process um, to perform um, the setup. In a new approach, we would like not to connect to ICON, but to the coupler YAC um, that sits between ICON Atmosphere and ICON Ocean. That has the advantage that um, YAC is also very good at um, resampling to um, different grids, if that would be required. And YAC is also implemented in C++ and not in Fortran, which would make um, the, the interfacing to this uh, library much easier from our side. Here are some timings um, that um, I, I took um, from a test run using in-situ visualization. And what you can see here is um, at the lower part that what is actually required to do the in-situ visualization time-wise is very, 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 very small compared to what time is needed to run the simulation itself. Okay, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Here are a couple of links that would be interested to you. Um, the first one, paraview.org, is the main website that you would like to visit. Um, there you can download Paraview for many different operating systems, um, Unix, Linux, Mac, Windows. Um, and then also you find there some tutorials to use Paraview to get, to get you started. And um, if you're later run to trouble, then I would recommend um, the, the forum of Paraview. It's called discourseparaview.org. And um, if you stumble upon a problem, then um, people there will usually reply um, within either a few minutes up to an hour or so, but you will get help to your problem very, very quickly. And of course, um, you can also look at the relation websites from DKZ to see where you can um, get help. Then as Donatello also explained, um, if you want to, to inter interested um, to, to learn more about this, um, there is an Easy Ways online training scheduled to happen in September. It will talk about the um, high performance data analytics and Ophidia from what Donatello taught you in the last session and also a more in-depth um, hands-on session using Paraview that will be done by Florian Seaman and me from DKZ. Um, you will definitely find the website uh, where to register for this. And um, now we will go to some examples. You can play along if you want, um, but you can also sit back and watch what I'm doing. And if you have any questions, um, I will just now look into um, yeah, what the chat says. Okay, no questions yet. Um, that means that I will switch to a different view for you, this one. And um, now I'm connected to, to Mistral in a virtual session. So what I'm showing is some um, kind of um, one of the relation nodes uh, in the back. And um, so, if you clicked on the link that I provided, you see, um, yeah, can follow again the, the slides that I just showed as PDF. And there are two very, very small data sets, um, just five megabytes each um, to play along with Paraview. But it's enough to explain the, the main features. If you want to download Paraview, um, you go to paraview.org, click on the download link, and then here you can download the the one for you for your operating system and here's also some documentation available um, for getting started the tutorial and so on with paraview you can also download some example data sets to um, help you and and get you started with paraview and the last link here just shows you um, the user forum um, where you can just ask a question and usually get um, feedback quite quickly it is grouped into different um, yeah um, areas or different groups like Paraview general support, in situ support, and so on. I will close this now. 
and then start to look with you into the data. <clears throat> okay. So if you have downloaded the data, um, you find these two NetCDF files. Those, those are both um, icon NetCDF files. But with Paraview, you can also visualize other NetCDF data files like regular NetCDF CF convention data, MPAS data, um, CSOM data. And over the last um, months, we extended all to visualize other grids um, and we are in the midst of making or applying these transitions to to the uh, master branch of Paraview and Kitware and hopefully it will be available in one of the future releases. If you are working with NetCDF files, um, one of the, the most powerful tools is um, CDO. CDO are the climate data operators that are developed at MPIM in Hamburg. Um, they have also a nice website where you can find tons of different documentation for this one. And um, NCDump is a very, very important tool to look into the data. And of course, also the NetCDF tools. Okay, now look into one of the icon files, um, NCDump minus H, minus, minus H stands for header. And then you write icon ocean.nc. And then it plots you what data is in there. We scroll up and then you see it's um, three different grids. I can basically is a kind of three different grids. It's a triangular grid, a hexagonal grid and a quadrilateral grid. Um, and I show you later the different representations of those grids. And so you have N cells, N cells two and N cells three. And um, here, Silat, Silon, Elon, Elat and so on. These are the coordinates of the cells that Paraview and the plugin needs um, to, to reconstruct the data. And then here you have the different variables that you find um, in, in the data file, like um, robot potential density in kilogram per cubic meter, or maybe the vertical velocity um, of um, the, the cells in the ocean in meter per second. You can also look at the data using CDO our death, um, I can see, and then CDO just writes out a little bit of description um, using an ID and the name, and then um, the name, the, the general name that, that the variables have. And CDO can also be used not only to plot the data names, but CDO is a very versatile library for data selection, data remapping, regridding, even for performing some calculations um, and so on. Um, and with that, I do switch to uh, my other view and switch to Paraview. Um, I do have not the latest and the greatest installed here. So this is just version 5.8. Um, 5.91 is the official release um, that is available on the download website. Okay. Um, before I start, if you would like to follow, what you first need to do is you need to uh, enable some additional plugins, um, like um, go to tools, manage plugins, and here you see a number of different plugins that are available. Um, I loaded the CDR reader and the embossing representation, and I explain um, both plugins later to you. And there are a number of more, um, but we are not using them in this workshop. So here I just um, load the file that I used before, iconocean.nc. Nothing happens. No, well, there it goes. Um, I click on apply. And then I do see my grid. It's a very small, very low resolution file. It's just one slice. Um, to keep things um, small and simple. And what you see here is um, the kinetic energy of the ocean, the, the velocity, if you wish. And um, it's just a surface light. And in the plugin, you can have 
different mappings. In the one that is officially shipped with Paraview, you will not have all the additions that we made over the last couple of months. Um, you will only be able to have a spherical projection, Lonla projection, and Cassini projection. And I think Mollweider and Spielhaus projection are not available to you yet, but that will come. And in here, you can also mask out, uh, mask out the land C mask. Um, this is um, in the data, and here you can see that the data is stenciled out if the land C mask is available. And here we have um, a longitude latitude projection, um, a spherical projection can be applied. And then I need to switch to 3D. So, um, Cassini projection is kind of the opposite. Um, of the uh, just, of the longitude latitude projection, I created a few animations um, that were especially focused on the Arctic and Antarctic sea ice. And the Cassini projection has the benefit that both areas are displayed almost undistorted, while the rest, of course, is distorted heavily. But if you are looking at the relation of Arctic and Antarctic regions together, then that would be one of your favorites. Then the Mollweide projection, also known, and my favorite, the Spielhaus projection. Okay. But I switch back to longitude latitude and maybe temperature. So if I zoom in closely, um, then you can see the um, underlying grid structure. Here I can change the different representation. Um, usually I only abuse surface, sometimes surface with edges, volume, and maybe an outline. If I click on surface with edges, then the edges are highlighted additionally. And I told you in the new edition, we can load the different grids in. So this is um, the quadrilateral cells that are kind of on the edges of um, ICON. Um, I don't have really meaningful data in there, except something like a land C mask. And the third grid is um, a hexagonal grid. So here you see the hexagons and sometimes occasionally, or 10 actually, um, these, these pent pentagons. And um, this is um, used for storing the, the vorticity in the data. But as an icon, most of the data is written out um, using the triangular cells. I will just um, switch back to the triangular view. And back to temperature. Okay. In Paraview, you have um, kind of this main 3D view um, in which the data resides. To the left hand side, you have the so called pipeline browser. This kind of shows the network of your relation. If you apply some filtering, some thresholding, some calculations, then there will be new modules added and you can switch between them um, to apply some some other operations and um, there's an icon an eye icon um, on the left hand side um, which you can kind of switch on and off um, if the icon is eye icon is kind of shows a closed eye then the representation is off and if it's on then yeah it's on of course then beneath that you have the properties dialog um, which you've already seen um, a little bit. Here is um, are some settings that you can apply for, for the power view um, for the CDI reader. And then also some additional um, properties like changing the opacity um, and other um, areas. Then there's the color map editor, which is very important of choosing the right color map to your data. Power view has a lot of color tables that already come with it. Um, 
automatically this cool to warm color table is applied. Um, there's an extended version um, like this one or some, some other um, color tables like this one. With all the color tables and applying color to your data, you need to ask yourself whether or not you are creating additional structures or features in your data that are not really there. For instance, in this representation, this area around 15 degrees C is quite highlighted and it looks like this is a very special region. Um, and therefore, choosing the right color table um, is sometimes considered more to be an art than science. The color table is usually also plotted um, right on the side um, by Paraview. You can also drag this around. I will switch back to the normal cool and warm color table. Um, and you can also edit this color table a little bit. Um, for instance, here we have this uh, weird um, selection plotting. You can just change that. And you can also write more descriptive name like C, surface, temperature, and then in brackets we write three C. Click on apply, and then it looks much more descriptive. You can also drag this around and, for instance, put it at the bottom. You can also make it smaller and move it to an area that you would think it's suitable. You can also annotate your visualization um, using some text. Therefore, you go to sources, go for alphabetical, and add some text. I can simulation. then you can find the suitable place for, for your text. Maybe make it a little bigger and so on. And um, here you, for instance, can see that you can also switch this off um, if you would like to not show it. Um, okay, so you've seen the projections and the different representations of the data. And now I would like to introduce you to some different views of the data that I showed you in the presentation before. Therefore, you can kind of split this viewport horizontally or vertically um, using the icons above here. And then what you can do is you can create an additional render view, um, for instance, like this one. And um, here you can um, kind of um, connect um, the, the cameras and showing two different variables at the same time. For instance, linking these views together using a right, right mouse click. If you click with your right mouse button in the scene, click on link camera and then click on the other view. Then when you move one viewport, um, the other moves as well. And you can kind of examine some areas on the left hand side now the variable temperature and on the right hand side the variable salinity <clears throat> other interesting views are the spreadsheet as i said before so here you see the different um, points the coordinates um, and then for the cell data, you do see also the different temperature. For instance, TACC, you can sort it by maximum and minimum. So the maximum is 30 degrees C and the minimum is minus 1.88 degrees C. And here you can kind of um, select the cells and um, the selection that you made on this side is uh, directly visible on that area over here. So the coldest water is found in the Arctic. Not a big surprise, I guess.
then um, other interesting views are maybe the histogram view. Um, for the histogram view, you first need to enable um, the representation object. And then you need to scroll it a little down. Um, and here you have to select the variables that you would like to display. For instance, temperature. And also in this histogram view, you can make a selection that is directly linked to the visual representation of the other side. So I will do that. So click on add selection and add a rectangular selection. Now I'm interested in the region between 10 and 15 degrees C, something like that. And so you see the area of the ocean in which the sea surface temperature water has a very has a has a range between either 10 degrees C or 15 degrees C. Um, another very interesting um, similar representation is the parallel coordinates plot. also needs to be enabled. We would like to see the cell data. Um, it's probably a little bit much. Um, I will disable some of them and only select a few, like kinetic energy, temperature, and salinity. And what you see here is, um, the selection that I made above. Um, so on the right hand side, this is the axis of temperature ranging from around minus two degree to 30 degree C. And the uh, range from 10 to 15 degree C is selected. And you can see in this representation that some of those cells have um, high salinity or kind of a medium salinity and um, yeah, what, what the velocity uh, in those areas is. So you can really see some correlations and draw some conclusions um, from the inside of the data. Okie dokie. <clears throat> then what you can also do is you can derive some additional quantities. Um, if you look into the information tab, you can see um, how big the grid is, for instance. So we have 20,480 cells and you have a uh, one point data set, vorticity, and then a couple of other um, cell data sets and you see the ranges of them. And we also have um, the U and the V and the um, yeah, vertical velocity in the ocean. And now we would like to derive um, the vector field that um, shows us um, the, yeah, the velocity in the ocean. Here we need to switch from point data to cell data, write velocity, and then in Paraview you have um, to combine the three scalar fields UACC, VACC, and WACC with the uh, unit vectors. This sounds a little bit complicated, but if you've done that a couple of times, then you will get used to it, and you can also find more information about this in the in the Paraview tutorial that is available from paraview.org and that will also help you to get started. Basically it's quite simple so you write UACC that is um, the, the name for the one scalar field times i hat plus v ac times a hat plus w acc times k hat apply and there you go we have a new variable called vel velocity and it shows the velocity in in meter per second in the ocean um it's really kind of a com combination um of three different fields so power view automatically computes the magnitude but you can also switch on to visualize its individual components. So X, Y, and Z. If you would like to compute the magnitude as one scalar field, um, you can again use the calculator. 
switch to cell data. And then as a result name, we write Mac. And as formula, we just simply type Mac and then in, in brackets, val. Click on apply. And so it looks the same, but it doesn't have any other components. Um, if you have higher resolution data, um, then you can also use an additional plugin, additional filter in PowerView to compute the gradient, the vorticity, and so on. I will show you which one that is, but um, applying it to this data does not really make any sense. Um, for this one, you go to filters, alphabetical, and then you see a really big list of different filters that are available to apply to your data. The ones that are grayed out cannot apply to the data that you have, but the ones that are not grayed out and show kind of a strong um, black color, these one you can apply it. Something like this gradient of unstructured data sets filter. In this one, you can either choose a scalar field to compute the gradient, or you can use um, a vector field to also compute the gradient of the vector field, but also the divergence, the vorticity, and the Q criterion. Click on apply and for a small data set that goes quite quickly, but for a bigger one, um, yeah, it's not fun. Okay. Then sometimes you would like to apply the um, classic operations like um, clipping or having uh, yeah, a threshold. So a clip filter in 3D, um, is simply like that. Um, this is a clipping plane. You click on apply and then part of the data is clipped away. Or you can apply a threshold. For instance, um, the magnitude, you would like to only have velocities above 0.1 meter per second. I, and then this is the result. And then you can continue further uh, visualizing the data or making some combinations of, of the two. Read this and start from there. Then um, one very important thing in PowerView is um, I briefly talked about this, but probably not directly. PowerView expects the data at different positions. So if I look at the data in here, we do have these triangular cells. And if the data is sampled at the cell center, as in this case, then it's a kind of a cell data set, like magnitude. A point data set, like vorticity, um, you can either use the hexagonal grid, then you would have cell data again, but here it kind of samples the data on the points of the cells. Um, some of the relation techniques available in PowerView, such as thresholding um, or um, contouring, um, are only available for point data sets. And in PowerView, you can use a filter for transitioning either the, the data set from cell data to point data, or if you would like to go the other way around, then you can also go from, from point data to cell data. But now we would like to map or transition our data set from cell data to point data and would like to pass the cell data as well. And here you see that it's now um, yeah, a little bit blurry. And what I would like to visualize is the temperature. And then using kind of an embossing representation or the bump mapping that I showed you before, it's not really as as cool to look at as in the relations that a high resolution relation that I created before, but just to to get you um, the idea of it. So um, I have as scalar field on the surface temperature selected. Then I click on bump map surface, and you see that there's some shading already applied here. Um, this can be further specified. And you see here, bump mapped surface, the data array, it uses this magnitude and uses the strength of 10. So 
if you have a really high resolution data set with little eddies flowing around, then these can be accentuated using this bump mapping quite a bit. A different representation is the extrusion surface. Um, here, the data, the 2D data is extruded into, into the vertical component, depending on, um, on the underlying field. If you have um, a point data set, then you have kind of a smooth interpolation like that. If you choose not the point, da uh, point data set, but the cell data set, then it looks a little bit like, a little jaggy like this. Um, and this would be kind of a nice way to represent the C surface height. The data, this variable is unfortunately not available in, in my data set here, therefore I cannot, cannot show you this. But what you have here right now is also a multivariate data relation where you have the color representing the temperature at this place and the height in this case shows the velocity magnitude. <clears throat> um, then in many cases, you're not only wanting just um, to visualize the data for yourself, but you would like to create some screenshots and share them with, uh, with your colleagues. And um, here you can click on File, Save Animation, to save an animation if it's animated over time. Or you can save a screenshot, um, click on OK. Then it asks you where to save the screenshot and the resolution and um, what kind of image type. So either PNG or JPEG would usually work. And as in any other software, very important because sometimes Paraview crashes um, you can save your state files, like um, save state. And I go into the summer school folder that I created. And then I write, I can test. Okay. Um, so then this is saved. And what that does is every setting that you applied for how the camera is looking at the data, what kind of transformation you have applied, what kind of filtering you have applied um, is, is memorized. And if I go to edit and reset the session, Paravi is asking me if I really want to do that. Yes, I will, I want to. Then it's kind of reinitializing. And then I can go to load state, click on that one, and Paravi crashes, there you go. I start it again and try to load it again. We'll see what happens. File. Oh no. First, then do need to adjust the plugins. They can also be set to, to auto load um, so that you don't have to do that um, every time. But that means the power view should not crash. Okay, load state, summer school, I can ocean test. Jesus, I don't know. This is not very good for the demonstration, but that sometimes happens. Um, I'm not trying it again. Um, I'm not sure what is not going well. Maybe it missed something during the writing. But what I would like to show you is, or wanted to show you is, when you are loading a state file, Paraview is asking you, if it should use the file names that are in the file, should look for different files in a different directory, or if you would like to replace the files. And that means that you can very easily apply the same visualization to similar data. So if you have like 10 different visualizations, all the same data, then you can create the visualization, the same day as visualization um, very, very easily, but just loading the state file 
and then just um, changing the, uh, the the file names. Okay. Because Power View crashed, I need to do that again. So it's selected, and I simply go to the next data set. Um, I can atmosphere. Um, so we just look into the data in CBO. I can add more dot and see, and here you see that there's a lot of different variables in there. Um, it's also a 3D variable, a 3D data set, but it's really tiny. Um, it's a very small, small area. With NC dump minus H dot and see, I can also look into the data, see how big it actually is. Um, so you see it's one time step and it has 90 levels, but in total just 1,200 cells. Um, so it's really a very small one. So I go to file, uh, I can add more. It also takes unusually long today. Um, I don't know if there's something wrong with the system, but five megabytes should be loaded faster. There you go. Okay, so now in this plugin, I select show 3D surface. I click on apply. And so this is the data cube that I have and I, click on service with edges and you see that this is really very, very small. I can click on the different um, variables. Like temperature. Or the cloud. Liquid cloud water. So we see that liquid cloud water is kind of at the bottom of this. <clears throat> and now we would like to kind of do some volume rendering of liquid cloud water and cloud ice. Therefore, um, we look into what information is available in the data set. So in the information tab, you see it's an unstructured grid again, and we have these variables, CLI, liquid cloud ice, and CLV, um, liquid cloud water. And then we also have these vertically integrated components Seal IV and seal EV. This is ice and this is water. And now what we can do is um, we go to the calculator again and combine um, the two fields into one. So the name is just simply cloud. And here we write CLW plus, uh, oh, sorry, plus. And because we would like to have an optical uh, representation, we just multiply the cloud ice by a factor of around 2.5 um, yeah, to get get that done. I, and there we go. And then we go and, oh no, hmm. that was not smart. Um, it works with this small data set, but you should usually not visualize unstructured grid data as volume. First, we need to do um, a resampling of the data set. Um, so we go to alphabetical, resample to image. And as I said before, Paraview is able to visualize data on different grids. The icon grid, for instance, is a semi-irregular grid, but is, is treated in Paraview as an unstructured grid. And all the relation applications and visual algorithms on unstructured grids are a little bit more um, computationally expensive. And if you would like, just like to have um, a visual, um, a qualitative, qualitative relation um, of, of the data of, of clouds, then you can resample the data to a regular grid, um, like image data, and then the volume rendering is much more efficiently and much faster. So we leave it just like that. Usually you would um, type the bounds in a bit more precise, so the 90 height levels, and then a uh, proper horizontal and um, resampling. But I leave it like that. 
and once it is done, uh, we can look at the representation. There you go. And here you see um, an additional form that we have not seen yet. Um, this is an outline um, which shows just the outline of the data. So the X, Y, and Z components. That is also sometimes helpful to, to visualize alongside. But now we would like to change from cloud as a variable and to volume as representation. And with this one as image data, we can interact with it quite quickly. And to give us some, some context, we would like to additionally also visualize the outline as we just visualized now. So here you can see kind of where the clouds in this simple simulation are located. And when I look outside my window, the clouds are not usually looking bluish or reddish. We need to apply some, some other color table. Um, something like whitish would be cool. And so I'm just using this one that I used some time before. Click on apply. Close. Oh, that was the wrong one. Need to change the color for this. There you go. It looks a little bit more cloudish in, than I remember. Okay. Um, and now we can also combine this representation with with other variables. Um, we can kind of create some additional slices in the data and put the slices either above or below. To do this, um, we click on the calculator, click on slice, and we would like to slice in the Z direction. Click on apply, and we have a surface. And on this surface, we would like to visualize a 2D variable namely the total precipitation that is available. And this is the variable PRLR. And we would like to map it to some bluish color. So from the color tables that are available, we choose this one, apply. So in this area where it's quite dark, um, it's heavy rainfall. <clears throat> Just disable the plane. And in order to kind of see also the clouds at the same time, what we do is we just um, use the transform that is available for every module that is available within Paraview. We just move it a little bit down, like minus two, and then it's um, beneath there. And you can kind of visualize both at the same time. The last thing that I'd like to show you is the relation of um, the 10 meter wind field. For this one, we go to the calculator. And as, as we've done before on the ocean, we derive um, the velocity field for, for the wind. Um, I have to check how the names were written. I think UA and VA. There you go. UA is one of the horizontal components and VA is the other one. So it's just a 2D vector field right, that we are creating right now. So in the calculator module, cell data is defined. As a result name, we write wind. And here we write UA times I hat plus VA times J hat. I. And we also would like to kind of slice this somewhere in the Z direction. Um, and if we would click on wind, Move it a bit down. 
switch on the clouds. And readjust this one a little bit. see the, the wind field as the magnitude of x and y and now we can also plot some some glyphs into the indicating the flow um, we can also plot streamlines but with this small resolution data set that doesn't really look nicely so we just um, plot glyphs glyphs are a representation of an additional geometry that you place in the in, in the 3d flow field or 2d flow field and um, it aligns with the flow and um, one example is an arrow but um, i prefer to somehow they look a little bit nicer here one needs to adjust a couple of things like the radius setting to 2.5 wind and it uses the scale array wind and oh. Okay, maybe a little bigger. And if we also map the wind on this one, um, adjust the color table a little bit more. Okay, that was too much. There you go. And now you have something really complex um, that needs to be understood a little bit. And that is kind of the art of creating a meaningful visualization. So we move this a little bit up. Oh, that's the wrong one. This one. Okay, and um, now just for the fun of it, I just um, because we are nearing the end, I would like to have some time for questions. I am trying to save this as a state file. Save state. Summer school. Best. Okay. Edit with that session. <clears throat> and try to load the state again and see whether it crashes or not. Okay. Then probably something went wrong with writing the state file in the first place. So this is what I wanted to show you. So when you load a state, it gives you these options. You can either use the file names from the state file. That would be um, kind of continuing your work where you have left off. Um, you can search for files under different directories. So here you just can have to browse it. Or you can choose different file names. Um, if you just click on OK, it uses the same data, but if you would have changed it, then um, you can apply the same visualization using a different, uh, on, on a different data set. And that is quite beneficial. So there you go. Um, it didn't take long, and you can kind of continue where you have left off. With that, I would like to end my, represent my presentation, um, trying to see if there are some, some questions available. And um, yeah, I hope that I could have, yeah, could show you something today. And yes. So the first question is, um, Paraview is more for animation by using existing data sets in your data sets, it seems to me. Um, yes, I mean, Paraview is good for 
any data that you can think of. You can use it for simulation data, but also for measurement data. Um, and you can read in tons of different data file formats. And if there is not the right importer for your for your data type available, then you can easily develop um, your own plugin. That is what we at DKZ did a couple of years back because uh, we didn't really have a software to visualize our icon data. And so the idea was born to implement um, an importer for icon data sets. And um, this has grown over the last couple of years and is now a tool that is used quite regularly, not only by us. Uh, to get an idea of what is the size of your icon ocean and sea file and are you using special hardware configuration or your basic laptop? Um, so with the data set that I gave you, you can use a very, very simple laptop. Um, you don't even need a GPU for that. But of course, the bigger your data sets get, um, the better your hardware needs to be. Um, the one image that I showed you before from the um, Icon Ocean R2B11, which has um, 1.25 kilometer per cell and roughly on in 2D, around 200 million cells, you need to have a really good GPU. And this can also only be visualized in parallel because for some reason, scalar fields in Paraview have to be less than 100 million cells. Otherwise, he performs some clipping. Therefore, when you're working on um, DKZ resources, you just need a um, normal laptop and a good internet connection. Then you can connect to, to the GPU nodes and you don't need any special hardware because all of this is taken care of. But if you would like to visualize the data on your own hardware, then I would recommend a good GPU, lots of main memory and also good CPU. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? And in case you come up with questions um, that um, you think are in 10 minutes or so, please feel free to drop us an email. Um, and uh, we are also here to, to help and support you. And um, I hope that at some point in the future, we will also be able to have hands-on workshops. We also had these hands-on workshops for Paraview and other software at EGU. Um, we kind of skipped that over the last two years because um, these virtual workshops are, yeah, just not the good replacement for, for a real workshop, in my opinion. Yes, you still need good internet connection. Um, last time at the summer school, there was a question whether or not also WARF data can be imported. Yes, it can, but you need to perform some some um, CDO processing. If you're interested in that, um, I do have an email that describes all of the processing. So if you have WARF data and would like to visualize WARF data with Paraview, then um, please send me an email. Otherwise for WARF data, um, Vapor is a great choice. No, it's not that difficult to develop a new plugin. Um, when you go to paraview.org, you can um, you and you just download the source code and build Paraview from scratch. That is one of the requirements. And then you simply look at the yeah tons of examples that are there, and also um, at other people's code um, on how to import the data set. Um, basically, what you have to do is you have to create VTK data objects that um, represent the data um, of your files. So you need to read in the coordinates of the cells and the triangles or whatever you have, and then map it to, to this one. Yes, Paraview can be scripted completely in using Python. And that is also a thing that I forgot to mention earlier. Um, Nowadays, I do my simulations, uh, my, my, my relations um, in, in a script fashion. So I um, create, set up everything um, using the GUI. Then I save the state file. And um, then I create um, a script and submit that one to the compute nodes. And um, if you have no GPUs on the compute nodes, this is not a problem either because you can build Paraview using um, software OpenGL, Mesa, 
and that works really very well and so you can really also uh, visualize the data in ParaView. Um, for instance, you give the first node the, the, the frames 1 to 500, the second node um, 500 to 1000 and so on. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's true linear interpolation, at least um, in in the in the triangular uh, fashion. If you would like to have something more advanced um, that can for sure be implemented, um, you should just direct your question um, to discourseparaview.org, and then maybe some other people have the, the same problem, and then they can help you. No, it's not difficult um, to install ParaView on a server. Um, in the easiest case, you just download the binary and it usually runs. Um, if you have special MPI libraries as we have, we tend to build ParaView ourselves, which is not that difficult either. So you just need CMake, um, the source code, and then specify all the settings to your MPI and whatnot, what you would like to have. And then you just compile it. So it's really easy. Okay, if there are no more questions, then I think we are done for today. And um, I thank you all for your attention and for your questions. And yeah, wish you lots of luck visualizing your own data. And in case of delayed questions, please feel free to send us an email. Thank you.